So what I'm going to now take you into is the approach that I've developed over the last 15 or 20 years, which I coined called the uh, autism uh, comorbidity algorithm, which is really nothing fancy other than a stepwise approach to breaking down development, psych psychiatric evaluation, and treatment. And I'm going to go through this in a number of ways, but I'm going to use some cases actually to help us illustrate the, the, um, um, uh, the approach. So. We end at 10, 15, right? So step one. Step one is a developmental review, which is that if you're seeing individuals for autism spectrum disorder in clinic for behaviors or whatever issues that are going on with them, you have to start by really uh, looking at their development. And that involves one thing, looking at trajectory. We know that kids with autism have higher instances, uh, uh, prevalence of a variety of developmental problems, ID, intellectual disability, language disorders, and so forth. They often get identified or they get described at a certain point in life, but we know they all have different trajectories. So what was a, lang what was a mild language delay when the kid was four can turn into a major language disorder when they're 14. The trajectory is variable and you need to be paying attention to that. The other is to be paying attention to evolution and growth and maturation of interventions. And we'll come back to this as well. So let's look at it. And as I say, we're talking now a little bit about cases of kids um, that illustrate the developmental profile and why these kids might not have autism. And we're going to start with this kid, 10-year-old BJ, who's previously been diagnosed with a developmental disability. And this is his history. So BJ has a history of some early language and developmental problems. He was supported by a community child developmental center and a speech and language pathologist until entering kindergarten. In kindergarten, his challenges uh, acquiring basic academic skills were, were, were noticed. He was not where he was supposed to be and ultimately led to a referral to CDBC, which is one of the Sunny Hill provincial programs uh, before grade one because it was so efficient. Um, and, and, we, and, and they concluded a diagnosis of a language delay borderline intelligence, possibly ADHD, and being at risk for a learning disorder. So BJ goes back to school with this information. He gets put on an IEP, gets a learning disability designation, which uh, people probably know is what's called a high incidence code uh, designation, which actually doesn't provide any additional funding or very much additional funding to the school. Nevertheless, in the primary grades, BJ is actually not hard to manage in the classroom. Um, he can be included. He has some interest that he shares with the other boys. He's, he gets into the whole Pokemon thing, and they can kind of go around it. Academically, he's struggling, but the school and the parents kind of do a little bit of additional kind of scaffolding and a little bit of additional tutoring, and they kind of go along for a couple of years without having to make any major changes. Around grade four, when BJ turns nine, things start to get more problematic. So as he enters the new school year, um, the, in September, the teacher uh, does some initial screening and says, you know what, BJ's at least two grade levels below where he's supposed to at, be at. I don't know what to do with him in this class because I can't adapt this any further. He needs what's called a modified curriculum. He needs to be doing a different curriculum than the rest of his peers. But that's not possible because of two things. One is his established diagnosis of a learning disability and borderline intelligence and language delay would not support that, even a theoretical framework, and because that takes a lot of money, and there's no money in the system to help this kid be able to do something that, 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 that extensive. So by Christmas, things are not going well. He's getting more and more disengaged. He's getting frustrated. He's getting oppositional. You're starting to see more of the behavioral issues. This is a really, really great school district. So by February of grade four, <laughs> they, 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 they took a page from CDBC. So that by the beginning of grade four, um, he is able to get an updated psychoeducational assessment, which indeed concludes that this is a boy who's not borderline intelligence. He actually has an intellectual disability. His IQ is 63. And so the, and the psychologist also at the same time administers some clinical scales, including something called the BASC or, and another screening tool called the SASI. And we can talk about those at some point if anybody's interested. But these ultimately lead to additional recommendations within the psychology, school psychology report to look at other possibilities, medical causes for his difficulties, as well as possibly autism. 
Again, this new information gets incorporated into his IEP, and his designation is now changed to mild intellectual disability, and the new teacher discovers that mild intellectual disability doesn't get funded any better than learning disability. I said, why did we go through this exercise? <laughs> However, the, 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 the diagnosis now does support the, the theoretical premise that we need to move to a modified pro, uh, a curriculum. And so they are able to actually make some of those adjustments um, and, and, um, and, and do that. At the same time, when the parents hear about this modified curriculum and they say, well, what does that mean? Is he still going to graduate? And they learn about this whole thing called dogwood. And they learn that maybe BJ won't get a dogwood if he goes along this path. And they're like, really? Could you explain what a dogwood is? A dogwood is your high school diploma in British, in British Columbia. So that he wouldn't get a regular high school diploma. So by the spring of grade, of grade four, BJ is now, he's really having more troubles. He's pretty isolated from his peers. He's still kind of into Pokemon, um, but the other kids have kind of moved on. They're into Minecraft and um, Grand Theft, and some of them are into Grand Theft Auto 94. <laughs> but BJ still got his, you know, his pocket full of, of, of Pokemons, and there's two playgrounds at school. There's a little element, the kind of primary ele uh, uh, a playground, and there's like the middle school of playground, and you know, you're supposed to kind of bifurcate and go to the, your right one, but he kind of keeps going over to the elementary primary school playground where he becomes a bit of an expert. He knows his Pokemon, right? And so he is increased in stature suddenly, and he kind of keeps going back there, and the teachers keep pulling him back, and he keeps going back there. And the teachers are saying, gosh, this Pokemon thing, he's kind of fixated. It keeps showing up. He's talking about it all the time. He's talking about it with the kids, and then he's drawing all these things in his work all the time. It's kind of a fixation, I think. More challenges are, are starting to emerge in terms of behaviors. There are incidents at school where he's kind of losing control, dysregulating, gets destructive. There's even an incident where someone gets hurt. One of the per, one of the one of the, one of the aides gets gets struck, and a WCB report has to be filed, which brings things to a different level for everybody. Obviously, uh, again, you know, it's not really clear. No one's really kind of looked at why is this happening, but but in this incident, at least, it seemed to have something to do with him being denied his Pokemon. Again, this idea of the fixation comes up. So in spring, um, before grade four ends, there's another IEP meeting, review meeting. The parents at this point feel like BJ has regressed. He has fallen further and further and further behind all across the board, socially, academically, emotionally. <coughs> They're really wondering about the diagnosis. Was this diagnosis of an intellectual disability by the school psychologist accurate? Maybe, you know, a lot of people have been saying, you know, he has a lot of those features, like kids with autism. Maybe what he actually has is autism. So at the end of the meeting, there's a crisis plan that is developed in terms of some of the uh, acute behaviors, and the, the, the family is, uh, is, agrees to take BJ to, uh, uh, to a physician to get assessed for, uh, 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 for, for medical concerns and for autism spectrum disorder. And this allows us now to move into our, my first schematic set of slides, which is understanding IQ and ID. I think one of the things that we do not do well in this field is describe what intellectual disability is to parents. I think we use a lot of vague language to take care of our own discomfort in talking about this and sharing this information with others and telling parents what the reality might or might not be. And so we create terminology like global developmental delay and so forth. Now, when I use the word delay and I'm thinking about Indian trains, I think about the train eventually getting there, maybe 24 hours late, but it's going to get there. With intellectual disability, we're not talking necessarily about a delay. They might be going to a different station. And so the, the terminology, although it helps us, it makes us feel a little bit better about what's going on, it doesn't accurately describe things. And so I often go through this set of slides with families of kids with autism or not autism, but who have some, some kids with some degree of uh, delay and really try to give them an idea of what this is going to look like over a course of a lifetime. So this first slide illustrates what uh, kind of a conceptual model of what IQ is 
um, at, for an average person. So you have a green line here that represents an IQ of 100, average IQ, and on the horizontal axis you have the child's in chronological age, how old they are, and on the vertical axis you have their mental age, their age equivalent, how old they act. So in a, a kid with uh, an IQ of, 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 of 100, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. When they're five, they act like they're five. When they're 10, they act like they're 10. When they're 15, they're 15. And if we just assume for the sake of argument that at 20, we end all our development and hit our ceiling, <laughs> that's where they're supposed to be at 20. Now, what if we look at kids with BJ's level of IQ, an IQ of 65? And what we see is that BJ will and should learn but he's going to learn at a different pace. The slope of his acquisition of knowledge and information and learning is going to be at a different pace so that when he's five, he's actually delayed, but probably, you know, more like a six, more like a four-year-old. By the time he is 10 years of age, he's now functioning more like a six-year-old. And by the time he hits 20 and theoretically finishes his development, he's ceiling effect. He, hits the, the, the ceiling at about age 13 age equivalent. That would be a good outcome for an individual with a mild intellectual disability. Now 13 doesn't seem, might seem very low, and it is in some regards, but I think I always uh, uh, keep in mind that lots of places in the world that I've traveled, 12 and 13 year olds manage themselves. And so it, 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 it is a jump um, um, to be able to manage uh, yourself that, that's still, I think, within the range of uh, some degree of self-autonomy. What about taking this model forward and we say, what about a, a kid with an IQ of 50, which was what we would call a modern intellectual disability? Well, this kid as well is going to have his own slope and his own uh, uh, degree of improvement, but it's going to be on a different rate. So at age five, he's more like a two and a half year old. At age 10, he's more like a, a five year old. And when he hits his ceiling at the age of 20, if things go well, we will get this kid to a 10 year old age equivalent. And to complete the model here, if you look at an individual with its a, a severe intellectual disability, an IQ of uh, say 25, they also have a uh, steady gain but on a different slope. And so when they're 10 years of age, they're really acting like they're two and a half. And if things go well, by the time they hit uh, 20 and they hit their ceiling, we are getting this kid to a kindergarten level. Now, this is really helpful in a number of respects, not only just thinking about it. I show these slides and I have this very common experience where you see these parents and the light goes on and the lights go off. And it's like, oh my God. And it makes sense. And I think one of the things I, why I show this so often is I think we really need to start being more honest with, 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 with families about what we're actually seeing and not protecting them from data. The other is here this idea of regression. Now, I was just at, uh, my son had an uh, event um, uh, at school the other night, and I went to all the different stations where all his, his, his uh, uh, other grade eight students were doing their things, and I was thinking about this slide. Why was I thinking about the side? Because I was thinking about what I usually talk about when I say this, is that when we think about our kids, we think about them in context and comparison to other kids of their own peer group. We think about them when they're in grade six, like the all other grade sixes, in grade three, like all the other grade threes. And when they're in grade 10, we compare them to all the other grade tens. If you do that, what you're going to see is that the gap will widen. It is anticipated that the gap will widen. That if you have an intellectual disability, the, 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 you will be making gains, but the gap between you and your same age peers is anticipated to widen. That is not a true regression. The other thing this really helps us understand is context. Um, for, for people who are uh, educators in, in, in the room, you'll, you'll know this. You can have a group of early learners who span about a three-year learning um, range and, 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 and manage them within the same classroom with a relatively similar curriculum. So that's why grade one, two splits work. You have kids on the lower end of grade one, kids on the higher end of grade two, and they can still work. You get beyond that three-year gap, it becomes increasingly hard to include these individuals in the same curriculum. Now, I'm not here to say that integration or mainstreaming is not a good idea. It's just we need to be aware of its limits. And one of the limits is I think when you get beyond that three-year mark, it gets really, really hard to know what to do with these kids when the gap is so wide between them and their peers without making it more isolated. And you can almost predict when the, when the problems are going to, emit, uh, to emerge. 
for kids with intellectual disability. And for BJ, with an IQ of 65, it almost always emerges somewhere around grade three or four or five. Right? You hear the story, the kid has, has, has an intellectual disability, the wheels fall off the wagon in grade four or five. Why? Because they, they, one of the reasons, at least, is because this gap has widened. They've exceeded that gap, the three-year gap. 